everyone. Um, so we're on to the next package demo. Um, so we have today uh, Wanson Mu and Eric Davis. Wanson Mu and Eric Davis talking about null ranges, no. modular workflow for overlap enrichment. They're both from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, take it away. Did you need a mic? Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Uh, me and Eric will present together for the package non ranges that aims for generate non feature set with either block bootstrapping or the covariate matching algorithm. Um, a common question in genomic analysis is um, testing whether two facial intervals are significantly overlap uh, than expected by chance alone. And many studies have shown other uh, transcript. Oh, is it better? Sorry. Uh, many study has shown that other uh, genomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics are not uh, randomly distributed along the genome. So successfully detecting those genomic ranges uh, that are significantly enriched or duplicated uh, are biologically important. Example, like integration in cancer genomics analysis, uh, enriched uh, genome regions that enriched in somatic amplifications or depletions shows contains a K cancer associated genes. While this test uh, highly relies on the non distributions. So our package is to generate uh, reliable and close to choose non distributions for this example, high, uh, each non hypothesis test. In our packages, there are two options to generate non distributions. Suppose if you want to generate uh, that non-feature set for the feature Y, you could add a uh, subsampling Y prime from a pool of feature Z by controlling certain characteristics so that your Y and Y primes have similar distributions over one or more covariates. Um, in another case is when you don't have a pool of feature Z or you don't know which covariate to control, then you can subsampling Y prime from original features Y by moving blocks of the genome with the replacement, meaning that uh, one feature can sample more than once by, con by controlling their local dependency structure. Um, so that uh, the score, uh, including JC content or feature density, can be controlled. Um, there are already amount of studies has been uh, uh, going on in enrichment or colocalization analysis, and many methods has been proposed. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to go to our uh, non-ranges non website or this uh, bioconductor tutorial. Um, so there are many real data examples under this article's icons for the matching. And for the bo block bootstrapping, you can look into the tidy ranges tutorial book down here, uh, noting that our um, block bootstrap idea actually motivated from the GSC method proposed by Baco in 2010. Uh, however, we here uh, this time we uh, implement a efficient vectorized code to offer a genome scale bootstrap data rather than GSC uh, doing the block generate blockwise bootstrap data. Um, uh, if everyone has been clear for the difference between matching and the block bootstrapping, then I will head over to Eric to talk with the match ranges first. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and switch over to the, um... oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, it's the, in, in the tab, okay. Thank you. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, it's probably pretty small. Is that better for people in the back? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to open up a, a blank R script here for um, 
pasting in code uh, from the from the vignette here. All right, so um, thanks, Wenzen, for covering sort of the the beginning part where we're talking about the the two major approaches of this package. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the matching portion uh, of this. So this is matching covariates using the match ranges functionality. So I'm just going to sort of follow along with this vignette here. Um, if if everyone wants to follow along, you're welcome to. Um, so match ranges allows users essentially to subsample a pool such that the resulting match set contains similar distributions of covariates or genomic features as a focal set of interest. Uh, and so as a visual example, uh, we have this little diagram here where we have a focal set of ranges here on the right. Uh, and what you'll notice about them is that in this little toy, toy example here that they're different colors and lengths. And then on the left, we have a pool set which has ranges in different positions, and those are also have their own distribution of, of color and length here. And so what we can do is we can use match the match ranges function here, setting color and uh, length of the genomic ranges as covariates in our model, and it will pull out a match set of ranges, the same number of ranges as your focal set, but they're going to be matched for those covariates of, of color and length. And the uh, match ranges uh, the null ranges package also comes with helpful visualization functions for visualizing the distributions of your covariates in these different sets. Um, and the benefit of this is that the resulting sets can then be compared in, in whatever, when a, whatever way you would like um, without the potential confounding effects from these covariates. Uh, so my research is focused on uh, 3D chromatin structure. And one of those chromatin structure, uh, one of those um, 3D chromatin structure is, is uh, chromatin loops. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, chromatin loops and use that as a biological example for this um, for this vignette. So uh, if you don't know, most chromatin loops are formed in a process known as loop extrusion, where this ring-like cohesion structure extrudes chromatin until it's stopped at both ends by a bound CTCF transcription factor. Um, therefore, most of these uh, chromatin loops tend to have CTCF bound in their loop anchors. Um, because these are transcription factors, one, um, these chromatin loop anchors also tend to have CTCF in accessible chromatin regions, and this can act for, in this case, as a potential confounder. So suppose that we wanted to compare CTCF occupancy between the anchors of looped and unlooped ranges. Match ranges can help by generating a set of null ranges that control for this confounding by um, chromatin accessibility. Uh, so in order to do that in this uh, demo here, we've assembled this object called HD19 10 KB bins, where we've taken uh, every 10 KB range of the HD9 uh, human HD19 genome, and we've annotated it with CTCF sites, uh, DNAs, the number of DNA sites, and the, the strength of these DNS sites along with whether or not this range contains a loop anchor. Um, so with that introduction, uh, we can go ahead and get started with the code. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this code here and paste it in. So first, we can load in the object and take a look at and see how that appears. I will attempt to do that here. Is that better? Okay, thanks. Okay, <laughs> sorry, a little bit of uh, loading from the cache here. Uh, so what you can see is we have a G ranges object and, and for convenience, we're renaming it to bins here. Um, and what this has is every 10 KB region along the HD9 genome. 
uh, but it's got in the metadata columns here information about the covariates that we're interested in. So it's got the number of CTCF sites, CTCF signal, uh, the number of DNA sites and DNA signal here, as well as whether or not it's looped. So in order to use match ranges, it's fairly simple. Uh, first, you need to define the focal and pool sets. So focal being the sets that you're interested in. So in that case, this is going to be um, bins that are looped. So I'm going to define focal here as the bins where bins looped is true and run that code. And the pool set is going to be where the where there are no loop anchors, so where looped is false. And to use match ranges, first we'll load our package here. And I'm just going to copy this code here. So I'm going to replace the code that's already here with focal pool. And our covariates here are going to be DNA signal and the number of DNA sites. And so we can run this. And in just a second, what we get out is a matched G ranges object here. Um, so what this is, is the result of uh, match ranges performing the matching operation. It's um, finding the, the ranges with the correct distributions and returning it as a matched G ranges object, which functions essentially as uh, a normal G ranges object. And so the next section here is showing you how you can use the match G ranges object just like a normal, oops, just like a normal G ranges object. So we can do we can use um, so we can use the um, packages, genomic ranges, ply ranges, and ggplot to perform. operations on these genomic ranges. Have you ever seen this before? <laughs> Has anybody else seen this before? <laughs> yeah. All right. Good idea. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, like, oops. Oops. Just like refresh the <laughs> block due to a security threat. <laughs>
All right. Uh, with Mike's suggestion, we're going to ditch the live coding. <laughs> I apologize um, for the, the difficulty. All right, well, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, finish through this uh, vignette here. So, um, yeah, so the result, and, and really all of this is sort of in the vignette anyway, so there's not too much additional that, that I was going to demonstrate here, but um, feel free to, to later go ahead and go through it and uh, play around with some of these functions as well. Um, so essentially what I was showing here was that we can use uh, packages like fly ranges, which supply functions for doing tidy verb-like operations on genomic ranges, and allows you to um, manipulate your matched G ranges object as if it was a regular G ranges object. So here we're grouping by, summarizing, and then plotting uh, the result here. Um, doesn't really matter what what we're plotting here; it's more just to, to demonstrate that it can be used for um, for doing these these sorts of operations. Uh, so once you've actually generated your match G ranges object, uh, one thing that you'll want to do is assess the quality of your matching. So you can do that using the overview function here, which is provides a quick look at how well your your covariates were matched. So for every set, the focal matched in pool set, it provides the number of ranges that were pulled, the means and standard deviations if they're continuous variables, or the number if they're categorical variables. Um, Aside from, um, aside from uh, looking at it with the overview function, we can also use plots to visualize how well the matching was done. So if we, uh, I'm gonna skip over this plot in the interest of time, but you can plot the covariates um, using patchwork here to visualize all the covariates that were matched. And we provide a number of different types of plots for visualizing these. Um, so in this case, we have a, a density plot or this sort of uh, stacked bar plot here for categorical variables. And um, if you don't like the way these visual visualizations are made, then you can extract the match data with an uh, accessor function, uh, the match data accessor function as well. Uh, and so finally, once we have our matched ranges, we can uh, actually investigate the, the question that we were interested in. Um, which is comparing the CTC, CTCF sites between looped and unlooped um, uh, loop anchors or genomic regions. Uh, so as you can see here, the uh, loop set contains a high percentage of CTCF sites. Uh, the unlooped or pool set contains fewer. Um, but once we perform our matching, controlling for the effect of these potential uh, confounders, you can see that there's um, an increase in CTCF relative to what you would expect. And uh, essentially, this means that we attain a more meaningful difference due to looping when we're matching on these covariates. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, yes. I guess it's a very simple question. Uh, do you recommend doing this matching and generating the reference distribution multiple times to account for random sampling? Yes, you can do that. Uh, so in this example, we've set a seed for reproducibility, but you're uh, welcome to uh, iterate through these matched samples until you get one that is uh, matched because visualizing these distributions is an important part of assessing that the covariates are uh, appropriately, uh, the distributions are appropriately balanced. Yes. And I guess, how do you balance that with not cherry picking sort of the best result. Yeah, so this is sort of done upstream of um, upstream of your, your inference. So really you do your matching before, before you do your statistical test. So it's appropriate to do so. Um, I just want to make sure that I've understood how it's working. It seems like you're adjusting the bin sizes until you get the right parameters that match your your null distribution of parameters. Is that correct? 
uh, not not quite in in this. Ex uh, I think it's a uh, maybe a mixture of the two examples that I was showing. The first thing was showing the distribution of the of the genomic lengths, but the second example is it's not adjusting the bin sizes per se. It's it's um, selecting ranges from a pool that are matched on your covariance, not on the the size of the bins itself. Okay, so there's a subsetting component that you can yes. drop. Okay, exactly. that's awesome. Thank you. And uh, I'll go ahead and pass it off to uh, Wansen, who's going to talk about the, the bootstrapping, which is the other portion of functionality in the package. Yes, thanks, Eric. And I will now talk about the boot ranges part. Um, while data structure don't uh, while data don't have that focal pole structure, you would want to generate uh, artificial ranges from the original set. And one strategy uh, to do that is uh, naive permutation or shuffling. But however, genomic features often exhibit a complex dependency structure, either based on the placement or the local correlation of metadata. Uh, example here is a snapshot from Genome Brother uh, that JC percent gene density and the CRE locations all shows a clumping properties at a scale of five, uh, 500 kilobases. So if we do the naive permutation, then we we'll, would we'll, uh, lose the uh, natural clumping properties as well will break the correlation of the metadata. Here shows the histogram reproduced from Baker's paper that the um, true non distribution is shown on top uh, sequences that, that are generated from a random process. So if we compare the permutation and the block bootstrap statistic distribution, uh, we will find out that block bootstrapping is doing a much better job uh, to estimate the standard deviation uh, compared to the permutation with the true non distribution. So in conclusion that uh, block bootstrapping will do a better job to capt uh, clumping properties as well as uh, estimating the bootstrap statistic. Uh, during the simulation, we found out URLA permutation will have a smaller uh, variance so that your uh, test will have a, a much smaller p-value, which may cause the false positive. Then go through here. Uh, this uh, shows our methods process. In the figure A, we can say usually the feature sets are showing several homogeneous sets along the genome. Here, different colors may represent different feature density. Example, high gene density, middle gene density, and low gene density. So the algorithm would do uh, block bootstrapping within each segment station state uh, separately. Example here, uh, we will randomly select a block with length LB from the rest state and uh, move it to a tail block across chromosome within the same state. Then the workflow for the block um, boot ranges is first we will compute a statistic um, by overlap ranges y and ranges x. Then after you derive the boot ranges by given optional segmentation or exclude ranges, you repeat the step uh, step one to derive a bootstrap statistic distribution. Uh, given enough uh, multiple times bootstraps to assume normality assumption, you can do a z-test to for the hypothesis testing whether there is true biological enrichment between the two feature sets. For this demo, I will first load a, a DNA hypersensitive set from ENCODE project that has been pre-processed and uh, stored in the non rigid data. Uh, so, firstly, we could look at the overview of the data. It has more than seven uh, one hundred 
it's close to the 200,000 ranges. But thinking that your bootstrap data is many times larger than your original data. So filtering and trimming extra metadata can help make the analysis more efficient. Here, we, just, we filter based on a metadata column to remove the noise uh, ranges and only select uh, because afterward, we will calculate the statistic uh, as over number of overlap. So we only uh, will mutate the ID number here and select that metadata column. Oh, we have to first elaborate the apply ranges. Then after this step, we, all, we will have all, uh, 60, to uh, uh, around 6,000 ranges left that uh, falls on all 24 crumbs on HJ38. Then we uh, import uh, exclude ranges that we don't want to uh, fit, typically won't have features located in. Uh, here we build a pre-combined uh, exclude ranges, including the encode produce include ranges and telomeres and central mirrors from the experimental hub. Then for the segmentations, uh, we can we have two options, either perform a de novo segmentations based on feature density or download existing segmentations like the Chrome HMN from annotation hub or other databases. Uh, in this demo, we use the segment density function from the non ranges to use either a circular binary segmentation or head and mark of model method based on the gene density to uh, segment um, this data set with a segmentation length with, as 2 million bases. And uh, it's pre stored in the experimental hub as well. Here I loaded the CBS one. Um, there are also functions plus segment to evaluate the segmentation perf uh, performance. You can uh, just need to elaborate non ranges and the plot segment uh, given the s s segment GR ranges exclude ranges. And the type of plot we want, suppose we want a ranges plot. Then it will show uh, the segmentation state across the whole, all the chromosome. Um, can the ranges that can connect together if they belong to the same state. And the breakpoint here may be caused by the exclude ranges or the transition between different states. Uh, then given the block lengths, uh, we are ready to run the boot ranges. Here I ran 20 times iterations, but normally you will do a uh, hundred times. Um, but based on different statistics, you can change the R here. To look at the return object is actually uh, a subclass of GR ranges with block returned as an integer format, an iteration number and block length uh, recorded as a factor RLE format. Then we are ready to, uh, no, uh, then we can, could access the quality of our bootstrap samples. Firstly, we have to combine the original set with the bootstrap dash set by mutate a iteration number zero to record the original set. And then we can easily use the summarize function from the apply ranges. Uh, here, I'm trying to calculate the number of features per iteration. The result showing here, the zero here, remember, is the original set. So the bootstrap that have similar number of features as the original set. Then um, uh, remember, the advantage of block bootstrapping over the permutation is that it can keep the local dependency structure. So uh, in order to assess that feature, we um, decided to calculate the interfeature distance to say whether it is close to our original set as well. Um, firstly, we define the interdistance functions and the return uh, it has the middle 
dif middle ranges difference if the two neighboring ranges are on the same chromosome and NA if not. And then we use the nest function from the PURR package to map the interdis function to uh, every iterations data and then analysis to plot the density Um, yeah, here the plus shows that um, uh, this three times bootstrap data is really has the interfacial distance density really close to the original set as well. Then we are ready to derive the statistic of interest and perform the z-test. Uh, imagine we are evaluating the enrichment of a feature X with this DHS. We'll firstly simulate uh, a 50 ranges of in feature X with the Ys as 1 million basis and decided to use the sum observed number of overcount as the statistic. Um, so for this arbitrary feature X, there are 64 DHS has overlapped with this, this feature X. Then we repeat the same step uh, to overlap X and bootstrap data. Uh, by grouping by the iteration and summarize the number of over uh, that count. Uh, remember, uh, noting here, we need to use the complete function uh, to fill in zero when there's none overlaps. And uh, then we are ready to draw the histograms. Uh, remember, the original set, there are 64. Uh, so it's false in with these histograms. Uh, it's, it's because of it's an arbitrary data. So we, um, although not showing the z-test he, result here, but uh, it will fail to reject non-hypothesis and saying that there's no significantly overlap between those two feature sets. Uh, um, but since our uh, downstream analysis is really flexible, depend on the statistic, we can also do the mean number of uh, overlap count per features. Then we have to do group by XID and iteration and also complete the XID here. Um, we can see the middle step. If we summarize uh, group by XID and iteration, it will return the number of overlap based on each ID and each iteration. But after we do the complete, it will return uh, zero for when this idea at this iteration has no overlap. Then for deriving the mean number of overlap per iteration, we'll have to add a new group by uh, function for iteration and the summarize is as well using the ply ranges. Suppose the mean overlap equals the mean of an then um uh, oh, sorry yes then the histogram will changes as well over Oops. Similarly, um, the observed the mean overlap will be 1.28, and it's still false in this, and uh, failed to reject the hypothesis. Um, I just want to mention uh, not only to derive summary statistic that can use boot ranges, we have a uh, lot of extensions. For example, to modeling the bootstrap, you can use like penalized points to derive optimi optimize uh, log for change for the differential expression genes. Uh, like this, or even you can use the count matrix from the summarized experiment or single cell experiment to calculate the correlation between ATASIC and the genes. Um, and our uh, data is flexible with different for data form format. You can either uh, do that with ply ranges or do that with the tidy summarized experiment uh, uh, object. This is the pseudo code. If you are interested, you feel free to look at it.
in the example on the uh, it's just provided for the um, for the um, attack and RNA seq block bootstrap. The RNA G, G ranges object is not found, and I believe that Leonardo had the, the same issue in terms of where it would be located for that example. Okay, just checking. Oh uh, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, there are sort of code. I, I don't have time to run uh, this time, but you can um, perf uh, change the summarize experiment uh, to a GR ranges and uh, extract a count matrix to give this numeric list to run the ranges. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, if not, I'd like to thank uh, our um, advisor, Dr. Love and Dr. Fastil and all the collaborators to give a really great comment on this project. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I think there's no questions on the chat and no questions from the audience as well. Um, there's a few more sessions here, but uh, I think there's questions in the pure auditorium as well. Um, do we break or? I think the next session is at 3.30, right? Yeah, the next session is at 3.30. So thank you. <laughs>